Look, I'd start, I found out when the police, or shortly after the police came in 1987 and, and rescued us, the, it became very clear that Anne actually, who I thought was my mother, actually was not, as the Brian Cousins, who was tasked with going through all of the adoptions and trying to track out who we were and what we were, laid out before me a deed poll and a birth certificate. So the birth certificate showed me that my mother was one of the aunts. These were people that were tasked with looking after us. And this woman looked after the headquarters in Melbourne uh, called Winborough. And I was found out that she was actually my mother. It wasn't Anne, that I'd been born um, not on August the 30th, 1973, as I've been led to believe, but actually July the 23rd, 1972. And it showed my name changing to um, Benjamin Saul Hammond and Byrne, not Andrew Bellman Shenton, as I was born with. Okay, so you've gone back to Shenton, but you've you've hung on to the Ben. <laughs> I've hung on to the Ben. I just found it difficult changing the name, you know, that I'd been I'd known as for 15 years or 14 years as a um, yeah to change it to Andrew. So I dropped that in the middle name, and <laughs> so it became Ben Andrew Shenton. Now, August 73, July 72, that's a massive difference. How, why did they give you a birth date like that? Yeah, good question. So, and from what we're all aware of, she only had one, one child, but she claimed to have had many others. So when she married her third husband, Bill, um, she was in these pregnancy spots that were made to make it appear as if she'd had, I think it was up to, what was it, 10, 10 or so kids. So in the time frame that that happened, she claimed there was triplets, there was twins, and obviously different different kids that she'd acquired. Um, so for me, that date was designed to set me up with another girl as a, as a twin, and they were the birth dates that we were given. And did you look anything alike, or did, did you suspect mm. something was wrong? <laughs> Good question. Look, no, we didn't look alike. And retrospectively, I should have suspected something. It's all you ever know, and it's amazing. You tell a lie long enough, I think what the Hitler saying, people will believe it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's so, what they um, say, yeah. That's what they say, and it, it is true. I mean, it's when you're brought up to believe this is reality, here's someone you're related to, this is what it is. I mean, you have no reason to suspect anything else until proven otherwise. So I do remember at one point a, a large, <laughs> I, I was just singing a song that came out of, you know, the classic 60s, 70s, Joy is my name, Love is my name, Peace is my name. Well, they pounced on Joy is my name um, and were very quick to say, no, she's not, you know, Anne is. So I should have joined the dots going, hang on, this woman, aren't you Joy? Um, who's down at Winborough, this, this property, that and lived in during the week, was actually my mother, as, as it proved to be. So yeah. I just didn't join the dots at that time. I was too young and didn't want it to be true. Yeah, that, that must have hit you like a ton of bricks. So, so 1987, could you go back to your birth mother, or what, what happened then? Well, my, my, my mother, as, as she obviously handed me over, I was 18 months old. I'd been sent to... You know, my father had been sent over to England. My mother was now looking after Anne's property down in, in Melbourne and the upper Fenchy Gully, which is where they all lived and spent 10 years pretty much living there looking after Anne. And she'd agreed that she would step into the background as Auntie Joy and have nothing to do with me. So my first connection with her, I would have been 12, just a passing conversation, one of many kids. Um, another one was when I'd been overseas as a in 1984, so I would have been 12 thinking I was 13. Um, hang on, 12 thinking I was 11. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's good. That so must I, be very confusing, Ben. Like, yeah, it's yeah. E even, even many years on, it's still trying to connect the actual date. So anyway, when I came back, I'd had a brief conversation with her, what the trip was like. She was interested. I got into trouble for doing that because I was told I wasn't allowed to. And then when I was pulled out of the cult, she rang me under the direction of Anne and just said, listen, you're an embarrassment to, to me. Don't ever bother turning up on my doorstep, you know. So that terminated that. Um, and then we eventually connected many, many years later. I'd been married, got married at 20. Um, I'd had both of my children by then. I was going to visit my grandmother. And 
Joy, who at that stage was living over in England, um, we used to come back almost yearly or bi-yearly to spend time with Anne, um, and then she'd visit her mother. So it was one of those occasions we just happened to cross paths, and we both determined now's the time to stay in contact. So, you know, we've done that over the last 15 years and have... You know, as a pretty good relationship is as good as it can be. That's with some that's topics. great. That's great news. That is that mm. is that must um, it's good. out. Yeah, um, you became a ward of the state. How did you come to live in Ballarat? Well, I, so yeah, I finished year twelve down in Melbourne. I'd been living um, in a home for boys and girls called St John's, which is I think in Canterbury there. Uh, Next door was a place called St Martin's and there was a group of kids in there, young men that had come from all walks of life and one of the staff employed there, um, I, he used to teach judo and karate and I, I, I went along to those classes and he came from Ballarat. I was planning on heading around Australia with him um, and so I moved to Ballarat while he finished off his work. and. Um, in that process of when I was living in Melbourne, I had a foster mother. She was a born-again Christian. Um, never talked to me about God. You can imagine Anne claiming to be the reincarnation of Jesus. Oh, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't too fond of that at all. So just yeah. her lifestyle and getting to know her in discussions. And look, I, I became a, a, a nominal Christian through that time. I had a vision, convinced Jesus was, was real, which rocked my theology. I met the real Jesus. And so I was looking for a church for my girlfriend, uh, who I formed a relationship with. Uh, she lived in Ballarat. This guy, Peter, came from Ballarat. I was, I was working there. And I just looked, times worked out that it was really clear. If I was to head around Australia with this guy, I, I w- wouldn't make it. I was suicidal. I was well, depressed, I should say, just considered suicide. I was a pretty messed up young man. and and. and when I came into the church, um, my girlfriend got witnessed to by a, a lady she was at on lunch. I was looking for a church for her. I came along to the Potter's House that, that was there in Ballarat as a 18-year-old and, and became a born-again Christian as I was pre- presented with the claims of Christ uh, and decided it was quite clear you know, it was best if I stayed. So that was 1991, January 1991. and. I didn't leave there until 2014, so I spent many, many years, uh, had my, married my wife there, children there, got a job at IBM there, which I still have, uh, passed, eventually pastored that church, uh, joined the Tan Clan, have very fond memories and keep in relationship with some of the people. Now, so, just to clarify, the Tan Clan is not a cult, it's a running no, group, it's isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a running group, yes, Richard Tan, run, which he runs, uh, trains people for marathons, yeah, I met some wonderful people from there. Um, I think John Burt, we called coach, um, who's actually been on the council there, Sam McIntosh, I think who's a councillor. I a believe she still runs stuff. around the lake, yeah. Still yeah. runs around the lake. And there'd be many others that I remember well and they're very, very fond memories. So, yeah, it's it's been good times. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law still live there and I'm in fact going to be back there the uh, around Christmas time to catch up. So looking forward to it. So, Ben, you're in the process of writing a book. Um, what's the, the working title and, and what's it actually about? Okay, so I've called it Life Behind the Wire, Rescuing the Family. And what I've, you can imagine, years and years have passed and I'm sort of able to look back on how did I become part of it? What did it do to me, the ideology that Anne taught and I grew up in? How did the cult happen? And what lessons can we learn from that? So I look at the answers I've worked through in life and how I've seen it play out. So it tells my story, touches on how my mother became involved, my relationship with her, the pathologies I've had to overcome, and then looks at what I believe to be, yeah, and I look historically how the cult happened in the 60s, what are the influences behind it, and could it still happen? And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that yes, it still is. In fact, it's... We're looking at the culture wars at the moment, very much uh, playing out of the very same issues in society. So I I see it as continuing. So I I go there on a lot of issues. My wife's in the process of doing the edit, looking at it and stuff. And obviously, it's you know I'll work through getting that out in time. And with Anne passing away, I guess it has an epilogue. 
what will happen, what's going on, and the lessons learned from her life. So. How, and and passed away, I believe, last Wednesday, but it wasn't announced till sort of the Friday, but how did you feel when you heard that? Yeah, good, good question. So I think it was Thursday night she passed on. Um, I got the news on the Friday morning as actually Lex Man was checking. He'd got a text message from... from um, some people just checking and, and he was the it. policeman and investigating he was wasn't the, he he was and thanks for clarifying that i have a bad habit of just dropping names without <laughs> clarifying so okay. yeah. lex, lex, lex demand was in charge of the task force forest task force that investigated what was going on and eventually was able to get her extradited from um Hurleyville, I think the name is, over in New York State and brought her back. So he stayed in contact with us, um, was part of the movie The Family um, that Rosie Jones put together. And, yes, yeah, so he rang me, you know, was I aware of it? And, look, as it was confirmed, I mean, I, the day just went on. I had a, a meeting, and you know, as part of the work I do as a project manager at IBM, had some breakfast with some close friends I was catching up with and eventually got it confirmed and, as I thought through it, I thought, well, I'm, I'm relieved. I guess the, the humorous part in me after a while, the, the song, the, the Witch is Dead, the Wicked Witch is Dead, that comes <laughs> out of the Wizard of Oz sort, oh, of, sort of rolled through my mind. Um, I thought of the damage she'd done to so many people, the fallout that I've looked at and seen. I mean, one of the girls I grew up with, Sarah, um, once in Burn or Sarah Moore wrote the book Unseen, Unheard, Unknown, passed away at 46 in 2016, I think it was. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of the other kids, in inverted commas, that I grew up with that would be processing that. Um, my own family. I just sadness of the damage done, relief that she's no longer here. Um, and it allows people to, I guess, puts a full stop on a very sad chapter in the history of, of many people's lives. Did you ever meet up with her when she came back to it, or was brought back to Australia? Yeah, look, on two occasions, I, th- I think she was there at, a, at um, a, a wedding I went to um, as a guest, and that was the first time I spoke to her from when I'd been pulled out of the cult. I uh, was there with my wife, so brief introduction, and it clarified to me why I would never be in relationship with her at all mm. um, and want to be. So, And then the next time, my mother actually in 2012 came back. By that stage, she sort of extricated herself from the Coles, although she still references Anne as someone who had a profound impact on her, healed her, you know, owes her life to her. Um, so in 2012, my mother stayed with me um, for a couple of weeks and we went to see her. My mother really wanted to see her, so I saw her again then and she had very advanced dementia by then. Did she know um, who you were? Or, or She didn't. She knew who Joy was, recognised her pretty much immediately, but had no idea who I was. She just, you know, who are you? And uh, asked me and, yes, yeah, she, she did, didn't register at all. Yeah. How... Did you feel cheated or did you... How did you feel about that? Um, yeah, look, look. as, as I've, I have... <laughs> I didn't expect anything. I mean, I, I had known from... And it's out there in, in the public um, square. She'd done an interview in with Sarah before dementia set in, which had Michael Stevenson Helmer in the background there. It was very clear that, that Anne was not what you could call repentance. So justice really is supposed to serve several purposes. It's supposed to, as a group of, as a society, we say that's unacceptable behavior. And that's why we have laws. That's why everyone lives by that rule of law. As a society, we go, that's unacceptable. Justice is also supposed to, because we're in a judo-Christian nation, we look for to redeem people. We look to be a time out where people come to their senses, as it were, and go, you know, what I've done is wrong. It's evil. And I agree with the laws of the land, which are based upon God's word in Australia, that that's wrong and I need to change. So we look for what we call a change of mind of repentance. Mm. Um, and then we look to rehabilitate them. 
So I, I believe that, and then I guess you would hope for the people that are victims, and I don't consider myself a victim and a survivor, but you would hope that they have some level of closure, compensation, whatever it might be. So as far as Anne goes, beyond all of those things, she really was someone who you know, was fully entrenched in what she did, believed it was correct. And so, yeah, for me, I, I just knew that wasn't going to happen. I knew that that, that was beyond that. So I guess the closure for me is knowing she'll stand before her creator and judge Jesus Christ, give an account, and it's not going to be a good moment for her. Yeah. Um, and just very, very briefly, life then, sure. life now, how does it compare? There, <laughs> there is no comparison. I mean, I talk through what happened then, and it's like talking about another person. I mean, I'm, I've been married since I'm 20, so what is it? 26, nearly 27 years of a wonderful married life, two children, a 20-year-old daughter, a 17-year-old son. They're doing very well in life. I've worked a job at IBM for over 21 years, part of a healthy church community. You know, I help people and am helped. Um, I have a very full, a very good life, so I'm very grateful for the life I have. And I guess the wrinkle in it all, I probably wouldn't have been born if it wasn't for Anne convincing my my mother to have another child. So not that I'm grateful to Anne, but I, I am who I am. And yeah, life life is very different. I have a very good, very full life. As, as they say, as a born-again Christian, I'm a, a very satisfied customer. Ben, onwards and upwards. Indeed.